Welcome to Raising the Bar, Communication Studies Edition, a one-hour video conference featuring Eleanor Light, Special Assistant Professor, and her colleagues in the Department of Communication Studies at Colorado State University. I'm Steve Dandino, Associate Provost at Colorado State and Executive Director of the Reinvention Collaborative. And on behalf of our RC Research University members, I wanna thank Dr. Light and her colleagues for organizing and hosting this professional development opportunity. Dr. Light will serve as our moderator as well as our presenter. Ellie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, good morning, it's such a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank everyone um, for joining me on, in the summer um, on a Friday um, to talk about this as well as the Reinvention Collaborative um, for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, I know that all of you, um, I know all of you, um, but for those who maybe don't know me as well, or for those watching later, um, I am Eleanor Light. I'm a member of the Communication Studies Department um, here at CSU, and my area of expertise is rhetoric and visual communication, particularly within online or hybrid spaces. So you're going to see a little bit of that influence as I talk through effective online uh, teaching. Um, I, like all of you, worked so hard to transition my classes from face-to-face -to, -face to in person this last semester. Um, and I've really had, um, I just was so proud of all the work that you all did, um, as well as the students in making that transition to having functional classes online. But I think at this point, we have to, to, to move beyond functional, right, into some really great online classes. And I've been teaching online classes for 10 years. Um, and have had the pleasure of working with some like amazing instructional designers through Tilt and other organizations um, and just have been really inspired by the ways that they have engaged the medium. And so my goal in this presentation is less about giving you a list of best practices for functional classes and more about inspiring you um, by what's inspired me. Um, and hopefully that then will inspire your students, which is really what this is all about, right? Um, so let me start sharing my screen at this point. Are you all seeing that? Okay, so um, what I have found is that superior online classes utilize an affective pedagogy <clears throat> by creating harmony and design, embracing the medium, creating interactive experiences, and providing a sense of presence while also establishing a clear rhythm. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I wanna talk very briefly about affective pedagogy. And then um, I really just wanna dig into these different characteristics that I see online learning um, using successfully in those superior courses. I um, mean, mostly, um, and I also want to say that a lot of um, what I'm going to talk about also engages a lot of uh, current research in communication studies um, about what works and what doesn't work in, in our courses. So to begin, um, if we think um, sort of in, in those traditional learning domains, we have cognitive learning, behavioral learning, and then affective learning. So cognitive learning is going to be comprehending, thinking, evaluating, sort of the traditional learning, what we think of. And then behavioral is going to be the application um, of that learning into some kind of skill. So not only do we understand what an informative speech is, but we're actually able to give an informative speech. Affective learning is how we feel about it. Do we have a sense of efficacy? Do we believe that we're good at giving an informative speech, right? And so that's, um, you know, typically where we see some issues in online education. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But um, when we compare face-to-face -to, -face to online classes in cognitive and behavioral, those, you know, we see online classes actually increase participation Increase, increase cognitive learning, um, and actually um, increase academic achievement in some cases. So that affective level is where we want to focus. Um, and this is shown in you know the, the last poll in May that was this was reported in high, inside higher ed. Only 29% of students surveyed found it appealing to only take online courses in the fall, and that's amidst you know 
a, a pandemic, right? And so there's a real hesitancy to, to engage in online classes. And, and, you know, a lot of educators feel similarly hesitant for, for, um, for valid reasons. Um, so um, what this poll, along with other studies in communication, can tell us is that there is a sort of lacking in, in the feel of an online class, right? We, we miss, we, we lack self-efficacy, we miss that, that peer interaction, we desire to have more interactions with our, our professors, um, and so that's where I see um, really a lot of room for improvement. And so the affective pedagogy, according to Ward, he writes, we should focus on designing courses and pedagogies that scaffold the bodily, affective, and interactive dynamics constitutive of understanding. And in my own research, rhetorical, you know, affective rhetoric is really going to engage the body, it's going to engage um, interactive experiences, and it's going to engage effective aesthetics. There we go. So in the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about the five ways that I see this type of affective pedagogy engaged in superior courses. So to begin with, to, we want to create harmony in our design. So whenever we're talking about harmony in art or design, we're talking about the satisfying effect of like elements put together um, in ways that are effective. So when you build your online course, you want it to be, you're creating an architecture or a space in which learning occurs. Um, and so the last thing you want is for that design to interfere with the content. This is an example from one of my, this is a, from a visual communication class. And actually a lot of the examples I show you are from visual communication because it's the place that I've spent a lot of time engaging aesthetics in effective ways. So this is a, my course uh, logo that I, that I purchased from a graphic designer some years ago. Um, you can see that we have a start here button, you have your syllabus, you have modules. These are all very accessible and easy to get to. Um, and there's a lot of redundancy, right? There's modules here, there's, there's modules here. You can look up here, there's more modules. Um, and, and redundancy in an online class is not a bad thing, right? And so you can really play with that a lot. There's also the use of hyperlinks, which is really help, helpful to keep students moving from one area um, of the class to the next area of the class. And then that start here button is so important for telling students this is how to navigate the class, right? Um, because each class is going to be just a little bit different because you're different as an instructor. Uh, each of my classes has a different feel to it, right? Um, and so I try to design engaging aesthetics that are really consistent across the syllabus. And then this is a, obviously screen sharing of my lecture slides here. Um, and here's another class. This is not, I started with this as for a reason. Um, this is not fluff. In an online class, what they've found in communication research is that, you know, in a face-to-face -face class, your tone that you set in the class is developed by interaction that you have with students before and after class, how you walk into the room, the joke that you happen to tell. But in an online format, this is it, right? Your aesthetics, and they've literally found the font you choose, the colors that you're choosing, those are how you're setting the tone. That's one of the major ways that you establish immediacy between instructors and students. Um, not only do you want the aesthetics to be consistent, you also want to have structural consistency. If this is a space that you're building, you don't want students to have to find the door every time they're trying to come to class. Right. You want it to be extremely consistent for them. This is how this class happens to be built on a weekly module structure, um, which is pretty consistent. Um, I haven't read research that shows that that's what you should do, but every best practices I've ever read is weekly modules. Um, and I'll talk more about that a little bit when I talk about timing, but you're going to see an overview section, a lecture, your readings, and then you're going to see the things that are, are due for that week. And that's going to change a little bit in terms of the assessments that you see, but typically no more than one or two assignments are going to be due, um, and those are all located there. All right, so not only do you want to have like a consistent structure and aesthetics um, and really creating harmony in the design, but you want to be able to embrace uh, the medium as well. So 
this meme made me chuckle when I came across it last semester. This show is boring. Again, this is a Zoom lecture, right? Um, we simply have different expectations when we're looking at a screen than when we're experiencing something live. So um, this so embodies the challenge of trying to get face-to-face -face lectures and the energy and the excitement and the aha moments that we have in the classroom into an online format, into a digitalized format. It'd be like going to a Broadway play and, and, and watching, watching a Broadway play on FaceTime or something like that, right? It's just not the same experience. And so I'm really inspired by embracing the medium and everything that the medium has to offer. When I spoke to uh, uh, Usama al Shabi, who is a well-known filmmaker and visiting professor in the department, I asked him, how do you do this, right? Um, and he told me that, you know, the best films pull the audience in with a dramatic narrative so that they're invested and engaged. And so to not be afraid of being a little bit dramatic or being a little bit performative within an online space. So here are some ways that I have engaged a more dramatic um, way of doing, doing classes and, preventing, and presenting information. So this is, <clears throat> This is a video, an introduction to a course video that you might see in a getting started module or just on the homepage of your class. Um, it, it, yeah. So this may be not something that is engaging to you. Um, maybe this wouldn't work for your class, right? Um, but this is an example of really taking advantage of the medium. This looks fancy. It was so easy to do. It was upload a few images into a template and download it for $8, okay? So very simple, but you get that uplift, you get that sort of inspirational music, right? And you start feeling um, like you're investing in the content a little bit. Um, in, in, in ways that embrace the medium, sorry. Okay, then of course, screen sharing your lectures and voiceover PowerPoints are excellent, um, but there are other ways in which you can kind of engage the world outside of your office, um, and you can sort of bring the students along um, on kind of a dramatic, more dramatic or interesting narrative. So this is, this is giving lectures in site-specific locations. So this is me giving a lecture on the use of the sublime um, in the uh, development of the environmental movement. So on a specific reading from a class from a sublime landscape. So I'm not gonna, have, I'm not gonna play this whole thing, um, but you can see that I'm literally at Devil's Backbone and I'm talking about sublime landscapes and how they have affected um, our view of nature. Okay, so. <clears throat> Hi, so I've made it up to kind of the top of. It was really, really windy that day. <clears throat> so, and again, super easy to, to put it, uh, together. Another thing you can think about is just doing a podcast format that really embraces the medium in ways. So just doing audio, if you can present your content um, or portions of your content in ways that don't need visual aids, um, this is a really great option for students already like podcasts um, and they can listen to your lecture while they walk their dog or cook or whatever. So beyond this, um, I like to create really interactive experiences and the courses that I've been able to, to view have created these really interactive experiences that are inspiring to me. Um, this is an example one. So I'm going to talk about a variety of different ways of creating interaction. This is um, this first one is about peer to peer interaction. So um, this was a large lecture hall of 120 students in a class. And so for my discussion, I divided them into three and I actually had TAs for this. So a TA took each group. Um, 
And there's very specific contributions, expectations for contributions, a link to some outside entertaining uh, content that gets them kind of engaged, um, and very specific engagement with the readings here. Um, and, and so I really wanted to point out these specific ways, and you'll have to come up with your own expectations, but I have students participate in the discussion on more than one day and, and also you know, respond to students, to their peers' comments. And the reason why I have them come back is that they post and then they never come back to see what other people have said um, in response to what they're saying. So if you ask them to come back on the second day, then they're really engaging in a dialogue with other students and thinking about, oh, this person responded to my prompt in this way, how can I then respond to them? Um, this is one of my favorite parts about teaching online is the discussions. Um, and I mention that because um, for students to be counted as present, in an online class, they have to do the readings. So sometimes online contexts actually solve challenges that we find in face-to-face -face classes, which is like getting students to do the reading. Um, and in an online context, they have to do the reading to be counted as present. And you also hear from every single student. So you get a very big, diverse group of students talking about whatever issue um, that you have. This is great in classes, especially like gender and communication, where you really want that diversity of, of voices. Um, and then you have interaction with lectures. So here are some things that I've done to get students to interact with the lectures. This is just a traditional screen sharing type situation, but I have it embedded in a quiz. And the quiz itself doesn't have points associated with it, although you could certainly have points associated if you wanted to as a low stakes option. Um, but you have, um, so as they watch the lecture, they can test their understanding of the material. I answer these questions pretty clearly throughout it. Um, so they can kind of test their comprehension of the material as they go through so that they know when they get to a more traditional assessment that they are on track to do well with that. This is another lecture in a discussion forum. This is really great for really like uh, complex subject matter I found. So I give the lecture here and then they can literally just type in questions that they have about the lecture in the discussion. And then I'm notified by that throughout the week and then I can go in and answer those questions. That's also great because then common questions are typically answered for students right there on the same page as the lecture. And then interaction with everyday life. I like to try to get students outside of their, where, wherever they are. So get them to bring the material out into their lives. So there is a bunch of options for this. And I always give options to not do this as well if students need to be staying home. Um, but um, there was a lot of options here, but one of them was to go and take a picture of a particular place and then tie that into the readings uh, for that week. And so a student went up to Horse Tooth Rock and took a picture of this graffiti cave. But you can see how that's engaging the body, right? It's getting students up, it's getting them active and trying to incorporate this in a really fun and interactive way. Number four is to provide a sense of presence. I cannot stress how important this one is. Um, study after study has shown that students need to have a strong sense of presence in an online class in order to, to feel good about it. And, and by presence, you can talk about it in terms of instructor immediacy, in terms of social presence or teaching persona, but whatever it is, students need to feel like you're there. Um, and I can't be clear about this, face-to-face -face standards are not enough. So if you have just the very standard, I respond to emails within 24 hours um, in a face-to-face -face class, that works awesome. In an online class, that is an excruciating amount of time for a student to have to wait for a response to an email. Um, and so what I've done after years of struggling with this challenge of, of trying to be present and available for students while also managing my own boundaries, um, I have, I respond to students within two to four hours Monday through Friday from eight to five. What this means though, and this might sound like super detailed, but I'm gonna share this because it's so important. 
I don't make any assignments due on the weekends because if I make an assignment due on the weekend, that means that I need to be available for them to answer questions every hour on a Sunday. Because even if we want students to be doing the assignments throughout the week, um, they are going to do it the day or the day before that the assignment is due. So you have to be present for them in that process. Okay, some other tips that I've learned about being present, um, you know, and you know, I maintain a very personalized presence in discussions. So I respond to every single student in every single discussion. Um, and sometimes that I included an intentionally not very deep comment here um, as a way of showing that sometimes I'm not, I'm not engaging in really deep ways, but I am, it's like a, it's a touch base. It's saying, I read your comment, I see you there. I'm reading these, I'm engaged. Um, and so this is just like great points, great connection to the Hess reading, thanks so much for sharing. Um, it's a little personalized, it shows that I've read what they wrote, um, and, and that's really the, the point of, of, of being engaged in that way. Uh, you can submit audio feedback on assignments. It's a weird thing to get, in, get your head around, but it actually doesn't take any more time than doing written comments. Uh, create assignments that award some percentage of points for synchronous communication. I don't typically do like lectures synchronously um, because I've traditionally taught traditional online classes, not face-to-face -face that have been transitioned to online. Um, so it's just not an expectation students have. But I do do one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings synchronously often. Use targeted emails on assignments based on grades. So the other thing that I really love about teaching online is that you're gonna get more individualized contact with individual students. If a student gets below a 70% or whatever, I send them an email and I say, how can I help you? And then number five, establish a rhythm. So this, Typically, or sort of instinctually, I, I always wanted to organize my modules around themes, right? I wanted to be like, oh, this is the introduction of the class. That's the module one. Then we're going to get into the history of, of social movements or whatever it is. That's the next module. And really, I encourage you to think about modules as timing. How often do you want students interacting in your class? If you want students interacting in your class twice a week, then you need modules that are weekly, that, it, that encourage students to log into a discussion twice or whatever it is. Um, I've gotten away with bi-weekly modules uh, at times when it feels right for the class, but you really just have to be really aware that, that those modules are, are how long you want students interacting. The other thing is to make sure that modules are stable throughout the week. In an in-person class, we can be kind of spontaneous at times, like, oh, why don't you have this done by Thursday? And then they can come back on Thursday with something. Um, really, it, spontaneity in an online context is really hard for online students. So the modules should remain very stable throughout the week. So you should publish it and then not touch it. Um, and then it should really remain very stable. Also minimize your number of assignments. Um, online students are just particularly intolerant of what they consider to be busy work. So make sure that whatever assignments you have, you have there for a real clear reason. So some next steps I offer to you. Um, take a short course on the mechanics and architectures of the spaces in which you teach. You know, utilize TILT, utilize those short courses. And I say this because A, you're gonna get good information about how to teach, but mostly it's about being an online student. You're gonna learn so much about the process of, that your students are going through by taking one of these classes. You're gonna learn a lot about what you hate and a lot about what you love. And so try to sort of incorporate all of that. The thing I learned last time that I took an online class was uh, that I don't tend to do things unless they're on my to-do list. Um, and so to think about what you really want students to do, you can actually add it to their to-do list and then they're gonna compulsively wanna check off that, that to-do list um, to get it off of their, uh, their list. 
Uh, engage peers, uh, colleagues to review your classes is always a good idea. And then mostly just think about how you're inspired in mediated settings. So do you love podcasts? Great. Listen to a podcast. How do they put together mat the material in ways that are engaging to you? Um, if you're into documentaries, what are the types of things that they do to really engage you into wanting to learn about whatever subject matter they're talking about? Okay, so that affective pedagogy, creating harmony and design, embracing the medium, creating those interactive experiences, providing a sense of presence and establishing a rhythm will hopefully help create this affective learning environment where students are valuing the content, they're internalizing critical thinking, and they're feeling inspired um, about the material and about you and about the course. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we can kind of start a, a question and answer here. We just invite folks to unmute and jump in. I have a question for Dr. Light. Hi, Dr. Light. Um, well, thank you for this. I learned a lot. It was the first time I've heard of effective pedagogy, and I'm excited to use some of these skills going into fall. I wanted to ask if you have a top resource to learn more about effective pedagogy. Yeah. Um, at the end of this presentation, and these slides will be sh sh um, shared with you. I do have the list of sources that I use to build this presentation. So that would be a great place to start. Um, you can look at, you know, Communication Teacher um, is an NCA journal dedicated to online best practices. Um, I'm blanking on the other journal right now, but there's two NCA journals um, that talk about pedagogy and communication studies specifically. So those would be two great resources to go to. Um, Ellie? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey. Dr. Light, yeah, it was really great, very informative, and you did an amazing job. Uh, yeah, really appreciating this. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah. Why don't you ask, like, how much time, so what would be like a, um, a common effective sequence of learning? So how long would be like a video or like, a, or a session for students to learn? Um, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is a rapidly changing environment right now, I would say. And I think that the challenge right now is that a lot of our best practices right now were designed with students who wanted to take online classes in mind. Um, and right now we have to shift to start developing content that students who want to take face-to-face -face classes, um, but who are in an online class will actually still enjoy. So a lot of the best practices for timing of like videos and length and things like that was 10 to 15 minutes. Really, it was under 10. At this point though, um, I think you could probably, and you can ask your students, I asked my students this summer, I sent out a survey at the beginning of the semester and said, how long do you want the lectures to be? And I got pretty consistent feedback saying right around 30 minutes was, was what okay. they wanted. So I've, I've, I've adjusted some of my practices um, to that a little bit. Um, and, and so I would say under, under 30 probably, but um, you can kind of judge it for yourself in terms of the subject matter and your students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, Julia. Can I jump on this? Because it will be the first time I will be teaching online in the fall yeah. and uh, a little worried, uh, but- Yeah, I'm uh, so here for you. When you <laughs> thank you. When you say those 30 minutes, do we imagine one lecture per week per module? Is it a realistic expectation? And here comes my uh, hardest question. Yeah. I will be teaching capstone. Any specific um, recommendations for teaching capstone? My, my concentration is um, global and international studies, so it will be communicating globally. And here comes the biggest challenge. Yeah. In, in the uh, uh, previous life, um, what I tried to do, it was a very interactive class, obviously face-to-face, -face, and I taught the first week and then from then on they taught classes and the idea was to um, basically show them, uh, all the students, to empower them because they would teach a class as professional 
um, educators. They were exiting communication studies. And yes, the content would be all about global studies, but all the things they've learned, informative speeches, persuasive speeches, interactive speeches, trying to control the audience, trying to engage the audience, so that face-to-face -face interaction was the absolute um, kind of necessity. Now I have the challenge of doing that and I don't even know where to start. So, so, so to answer your first question about the 30 minutes, um, yeah. that one, yes, I would say one lecture a week is, okay. is, what, is what we're looking at here. Um, any more than that, you're going to get just, you might have your dedicated, your 10% dedicated students watching all of it, but I, I think you're going to lose some folks if you're asking for more than that. Mm -hmm. As far as the capstone experience, I did teach capstone last semester, and so I did have to transition, and it sounds like my structure was actually pretty similar to yours, where I did have students facilitate all of the readings um, for the entire semester. Um, and so I, I did transition that into an online format where I just had my student facilitators build questions and facilitate those discussions online. Beautiful, uh, excellent. And, and, so, uh, uh, and before I forget, uh, yeah. so when, when you say those, uh, those lectures and, uh, with, of 30 minutes and all this consistency, so, if my class starts in August, do I need to have all those lectures recorded before August starts? That's a really good question. No, so what I, I typically do is I have, and this is pretty standard in the online education, is you have your first two weeks completely done before okay. you start the semester, semester. So that would be the goal that I would have. And then after that first week, work on the next week, and then you can just sort of stay ahead. Um, the first two weeks, I like to have at least the first two weeks visible to students so that students kind of know what to expect for those a little bit ahead of time. Um, sometimes they, they're not going to want to work on it yet, but they're going to want to know what's next. So I do like to have those modules open for them. And I like to publish the next module um, so that two weeks ahead, they're, they always have the option to look ahead a week. Excellent. Thank you. Whew. So nice to see everybody, Ellie, mm -hmm. excellent Hi. job. And I will share that um, through text, Ellie pulled me through complete insanity at the beginning of the change because I was teaching capstone and was teaching five classes. And so I was like, um, am I gonna be able to tread water? So Ellie was my savior. Oh. And some of the things, so I thought maybe I would share a couple of things that what she told me um, really came to fruition in terms of paying off. And, you know, I see your work and it's like the huge, huge high bar. Mm -hmm. But there's no, I, I appreciate that because then it gets me to strive for, mm -hmm. you know, just a bit of that. So a couple of things, like I taught capstone in the spring and I taught the four week, like today is the last day, right? Of capstone for the four week summer session, which of course is always insane anyway. Mm -hmm. So one, one payoff was the discussion, um, that idea of them coming back and responding to one another peers. So built into the grading system was that if they want all full points, they were to respond to the readings, my lecture, whatever, um, with two responses. Um, I remember the one that was most effective was I had seven prompts that I built. Then I asked them to um, respond to two of the different prompts individually and they had to respond to two peer comments mm -hmm. i'm telling you the richness mm -hmm. of that discussion i would have never gotten that kind of involvement in the classroom and so but it was because of la and and I will tell you, you know, this was why I was so strung out at the end of the semester because my grading was off the wall because I was putting brick and mortar together, right? The entire end of the semester, like everybody else was. 
So all that stuff took a lot of time, but now I've got a gold piece in terms of a couple of those built discussion prompts and then for other courses, how I might do that. Um, I used that again for the summer, but I shortened it a bit because of the depth. Another thing that I have I did was I did build lectures with my audio and that um, helped me a lot because then they were responsible for listening through the um, content. But what I did was I based it on what their responses were on a discussion mm -hmm. post. And so I was able to asynchronously connect with them with what their concerns were because Ellie had suggested that I respond to, even if it's short, respond in these short periods of time to every discussion post. Well, with five classes, I had to get real, like, okay, I'm gonna either have a mental breakdown or I'm going to do something different. So that's what worked for me was that then I took a video like with some PowerPoints and so it's not extensive like Ellie's like really crazy, but it's like just pretty straightforward. But I was able to, and I found myself sitting at the kitchen table doing the audio and not really following a script because I had made some notes. And so I could just kind of talk them through some of their questions. Yeah. Um, that was really helpful. Lastly, for capstone class and nonverbal, I did this too, but I finished up the course with a visual presentation. Well, I had been doing that for a year um, or so, and they would present it in class. So like, for example, Julia's talking about that this engagement, you know, and you expect that presentations are gonna be in the classroom and all of that. So I played around with, and actually my TA, undergrad TA, um, built instructions for how to um, embed audio. And so the students have two different tips sections on how to do that. And then we practiced it. I had them come back to me, play around with, let's see, one slide. Um, and that's what I did at the beginning of this of the summer session. I want to see one crazy slide with your audio embedded because that was due Wednesday, their big presentation on a family stress, how what was the communication pathway, because I was teaching family communication, and then end up with what, uh, you know, linking it to wellness in the family. And so then they had to have an engagement. So throughout the entire summer session, this is my last kind of piece, is that I met with them for two hours, um, Wednesday and Thursday, 10 to 12. Um, I had 10 students this summer. It was uh, it was just like golden. And Thursday, I did like an hour and a half. Wednesdays, I did an hour and a half. Thursdays, I did full blown. This is lecture. This is this. You're responsible for this material. And so there was a lot of engagement. I asked them yesterday, what would they suggest that I improve upon? Um, because it was our last day to meet. And they said, um, when I stick my little hand up, you know, could you kind of notice it? And I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh. Like, right, that had completely, I saw some of them, but I missed those yellow, yellow hands. And so, um, but those are the, some of the things that, so they had to do these um, video audio presentations. We watched them and then they had to come back to us synchronously and engage with questions. Um, and so that was kind of the finality. It's a 400 point assignment out of a thousand. And, you know, so they had to, I wanted them to get connected. Ellie, I don't know, you know, this breaking up classes when we have not 10 people, you know, 
Yeah. It was a great way for me to cut my teeth more specifically this summer. And I'm glad I had this instead of just going away from this crazy yeah. spring semester. But if you could speak to that, and then I'm going to be quiet. Sure. So I think what I just want to say initially, like it is such a great to hear you talk about ways in which you've taken some of what you've learned and then shifted it so that it feels right for you. Um, and that's really what my hope is for, for all of this is to just inspire you to say, you know, that wouldn't work for me, but this might. And so it, it just all the things that you mentioned are just great engagement with um, how, how do I find creative solutions to these challenges that I'm seeing in online. So that's really great to hear. Um, I forgot what, you, what was your last question? Oh, you're muted still. 10 people work great, but yeah. that's not our right. reality in the regular semesters. So, so that's what. Yeah, so you can, you know, break students into groups um, in group work. I mean, that's a pretty easy function on Canvas to do or whatever you're working in. Um, so you can break them into groups that way. I mean, I did full blown group projects in my capstone class. Um, where, that were semester long projects and they coordinated with each other, worked together, presented, you know, they created group presentations. Um, you know, they just, they had somebody edit all of their videos together and then they uploaded that to a discussion. Um, and I, to, in order to break the groups up a little bit um, or to create more engagement, I actually had, I paired them with another group. So one group watched another group's presentation um, and so forth. So that kind of created a smaller feeling um, to that. Like, and like I said, that large lecture hall created smaller groups. You know, if you have a hundred <coughs> students, you really can break it up into smaller, you could break it up into five people per group if you wanted to. Well, I my nonverbals are, you know, so big that yeah. for survival at the end, yeah. I just said, okay, I've got to accept this. I had them present to another partner. Oh, so, yeah. Or uh, in nonverbal, it was three of them. So yeah. I grouped them. I didn't even see their presentations. Yeah. Because it was like, I cannot do all of this. Yeah. So, and I can't be present every hour for their presentation so they had to schedule it with me so i knew that they were doing it and then there was an evaluation of one another's presentation and they yes they could have just lied and everybody gotten together and said did we did it but well yeah i think i think we you know and if, if anybody needs help coming up with creative solutions to specific problems like that i'm always here to talk through it and think through and, and, you know, talk to instructional designers. If you have a really specific thing, like we're trying to figure out a way to do public deliberation or the deliberation um, uh, speech um, in an online context. So, so how do you do that, right? So, so we're talking to instructional designers that have a lot of expertise in this, this and trying to come up with some solutions. So feel free to, to let me know if you want to talk through any of those. I just wanted to jump in um, because I've had, I just want to, kind of shoot accolades around a little social media app that has been outstanding in public speaking for me this summer and yeah. it's Marco Polo. Okay. And we actually used it when we were <clears throat> on our semester at Sea Voyage. Yeah. It's great. You leave little, it's all asynchronous, but you leave little videos cool. and people can talk back and forth. And I have broken my public speaking class into groups of five or six and they give each other feedback on their speeches that way. Or, you know, it's just a great way to have like discussion. And then they invite me into their groups so I can just kind of see everything going on and I can make sure that everybody's participating yeah. and comment myself. But it's a way to kind of just see that those interactions are taking place. And it's so easy for them to do. I've yeah. also used Google Sheets a lot. So I post, they post their links to their speeches up there so other students can just click on the link and go right to it and <clears throat> I don't have to orchestrate anything like that. That's awesome and I'll have to look at that. Is there a reason that you chose to do Marco Polo rather than just have them and upload their speeches into a discussion on Canvas? I just felt that it was it was super easy and I had to 
I was coming from such a chaotic position yeah. this spring that I'm just like, I want to go with something that's really easy. And then over the summer, I'll test out sure. using Canvas more. But it's gone really well. And I have two classes that I'm teaching. I just lumped them all together in Canvas. So I have uh, 48 students wow. and working really, really well. So I just want to throw that one out there. That's great. Yeah. And um, if you find those, I mean, like I used all kinds of outside technology to create my lectures and things like that. We want to be careful about using things like YouTube and we know this, but um, stuff like that where the, the rights get, uh, get a little strange and we need to, to make sure that we're keeping it within the university setting. But I think something like that is, is awesome. If it's engaging your students, um, that, that's a great solution. There is some functions I just wanted to mention in discussions in Canvas where you can enable liking and things like that so that students it, it has a kind of social media feel if you can enable those things so that's something to maybe play around with and see if it if it mimics at all the experience you're having with marco polo yeah cool thanks yeah i have a question um ellie if you have any best practices for holding virtual office hours in my normal online classes i notice like people don't really need those i tried to make those more readily available in the spring and would like email people the morning a paper was due. Just a reminder, I'm online today, but still only had a couple people check in. So any thoughts on how to make it feel more available to students? So um, I, I typically, after like the first couple weeks, will send out an email to students saying, hey, how are you, want a video chat? Um, or me online. It doesn't have to be fancy, right? Sometimes students are overwhelmed with the thought of video conferencing, but are like, oh, I'll talk to you on the phone. So that's another option that sometimes is helpful for them. But I also use the scheduling thing in Canvas, which can be helpful. Um, so you can just set up office hours and then they can sign up for them. Um, and so sometimes that's a way you can just add that link into an announcement. And sometimes that helps me a little bit um, to facilitate a little bit more engagement. Cool. I didn't know that was, I didn't yeah. know you could do that. Yeah. And then the other okay. thing I would say is that, um, you know, some of my assignments just have a video conferencing portion of the assignment. They have to talk to me. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important, uh, you know, to, to have a little bit of synchronous communication with each student, at least for me. It doesn't mean everybody has to, but um, for me, I found it to be really important. So I just make them do it for some of them. Oh, that's a great idea and you could even assign like participation points or something just to make it happen. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Julie, yeah. yeah, Julie, do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much, Ellie, because I mean, it's overwhelming and I don't even know how you do this, but this is beautiful that you are helping all of us. And I just wanted to jump on that question. So sure. for synchronous meeting, mm -hmm. what are your best practices? Here's why I'm asking. Um, on Monday, I start teaching a brand new course. Well, that's the most ironic course of uh, my and Carlo's life. Typically, um, I bring students to Rome and yeah. it has been a very successful thing for the last several years. Now I'm bringing Rome to students and I already promised that um, there will be a couple of, of uh, those synchronous meetings yeah. because the most important part of any study abroad experience was this sense of community and going through learning together. So yeah. I didn't want them to uh, struggle separately. Mm -hmm. So there will be me, there will be them. I only have 40 students, so it's manageable. So what are your best uh, recommendations for those kinds of meetings? Yeah. So I think we talked a little bit with this just via email, but using yeah. sort of a meetings with teams um, could be a yeah. way of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you could also split them up a little bit and do, you know, smaller groups synchronously if you feel like that would be a more one on one connection. And exploring, mm -hmm. Are you going to be going to particular places and doing synchronous um, experiences in Rome or what are your sort of Ideas. I uploaded I uploaded a lot of videos so there are videos uh, kind of um, I call them virtual travels so there are four <laughs> weeks and each week has um, readings yeah. and before, and uh, they're all organized uh, in a very logical manner but there are also uh, links to for example Asian Rome Asian Pompeii uh, 20 uh, nonverbal rules Italians never break, break stuff break. like this some have a lot of humor some have a lot of history 
and at the end of the week there is a discussion they need to participate in it but i also wanted them to um meet me at least once a week uh, and i also wanted them to present on cultural artifacts in front of everyone so this was the idea because typically in rome they yeah. pick one artifact and say well this is the Colosseum, and it's important for a b c and d and women and slaves were at the very end which tells us a lot about hierarchy and uh, race and gender and whatnot and the important part was for everybody else to see it and to say wow i see how centuries later it still affects us yeah. so i am targeting the same um kind of outcomes yeah. and so um this is what i'm what i'm after so if you have any advice for this uh, yeah. i'm open because so, I, I think at this point I cannot change too much because I said there will be a couple of those synchronous yeah. meetings and we start on Monday. Yeah. Um, my thought is that, um, I mean, I think you're on, you know, on the right track is to, you know, just build in some of those meetings. I would think about going somewhere and doing it in a site specific area. You're in Rome right now, right? Oh, you're not. Okay. Um, I'm in Vienna because Ital Italy is still in quarantine. That's, yeah. I mean, Okay. I wish. Sure. So um, the sort of second option I would say is also is, you know, doing your synchronous meetings with them, having sort of engagement with the material in whatever way it feels right to you, but perhaps also exploring some virtual tourism. So, you know, using Google Maps and Google Street View to get them to actually explore a particular place um, virtually. Those are really you know, anything we can do to get them to feel like they have a sense of agency within the medium is really great. And that's a little bit more of an interactive experience. So I would explore some of that. I know that, you know, your big cultural sites are probably going to have virtual tours um, associated with them. So um, that might be something to think about. Um, and then they can actually take screenshots as they explore that space. And then obviously, then they can do a presentation based still on that cultural artifact or that cultural space um, that would be just right off the top of my head maybe an option but we can certainly talk more about other things you could you could try as well uh, Carolyn or yeah. Juliet yeah um, yeah I wanted to ask um, it's maybe it's it's a big question or maybe a small question I'm not sure um, when when I teach an, an um, in-person class, I'm very much aware of inclusivity issues um, of all sorts of dynamics within the class. Do you have any, um, I don't know, any tip, any, any way um, that you already realize some issues that could be um, problematic uh, or some things that uh, we should be more aware of? Um, are there more people that um, that have certain I don't know disadvantages or privileges that me as an instructor should or can be more aware of? Yeah. So I think that um, first of all, technology discrepancies can be an issue. Um, so I like to touch base with students in that email very early in the semester, one or two weeks in. I like to ask students, hey, do you want to do a video conference? Have you had any issues with the technology? And it's at that point that I can address what I need to address if a student has really poor connectivity. And this is very rare. I have had maybe one or two, I think maybe two students over 10 years say, um, you're, I can't stream your videos. Um, so it's pretty rare, um, but I've typically worked with students that are online students. So they may already have more of those types of resources than our typical face-to-face. -face. So you may see more of this. But if that's the case, then I do, then I schedule synchronous, I would schedule synchronous meetings with that student. Mm -hmm. So that they're still getting that same level of interaction. They're maybe getting more lecture slides or something like that. Then in terms of other issues, that's one of the reasons why I'm very involved in discussions is that you will see some um, privilege showing in some of the ways that students will interact. I don't typically see this in, in like my visual communication class, but when I teach gender and communication online, sometimes you see a little bit more of just the, 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 the ways in which uh, language um, can, um, discount um, other experiences. So I'm very careful about intervening or adding commentary 
to comments in order to help them think through some of the ways that they're talking about gender or, or whatever it is. So that's another reason to be really involved in those discussions and not let them kind of gallop off in a direction without being really, really present, making sure that those interactions are respectful um, of, of, of a variety of, of points. Um, yeah, yeah. And then just the, the regular stuff, right? I mean, then that's not different than a face-to-face -face class. You're just in an online context. Mm -hmm. I mean, then just making sure you're assigning readings from a diverse range of voices, um, that's probably extra important in an online class just because, you know, that's, that's one of the major forms of communication that they're getting is the readings. So if you make sure that's really diverse, um, that's a really good step in the right direction. It's a really good yeah, question. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, thank you. And, I'm, and while you talk, like I, I thought also about the concept of the, uh, a bias towards text and yeah. that um, people that are not necessarily have English as a native language oh, yeah. uh, might have, um, I don't know, cope with other things um, when uh, a lot of the communication is by writing and uh, sometimes writing quickly, yeah. Yes, yes, and um, I'm very careful in how I grade discussions, and this is just a personal preference that I share, but I don't tend to grade discussions on whether or not the student has written it correctly or if there's grammar issues or even if they're right or wrong in, mm -hmm. in their engagement with the material. The discussion is a place for discussing the content. If they're trying to engage the readings, if it's clear that they did it and they tried, then they get full credit. I will take off points for MLA style. <laughs> that's the one thing where I'm like, you have to learn this. Um, and that's just a really small stakes uh, way of, of helping them prepare for yeah. the bigger stakes assignments. But I, I, I am really cognizant and it's, you can tell the students that are English as a second language in the discussions. Mm -hmm. And those are students that typically I can, <clears throat> you know, reach out to. Um, and there's like a great tutoring website now um, for students, RAM Tutor, I think. And so that's one that, you know, you can point students in that direction for additional help. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Was there one other, Juliet, did you have a question? I um, yeah, I could send it in an email though. Either way. Steve, are we running out of time or, or can we take another couple questions? Oh, there's a, yeah, I think um, Ms. Wright would like to ask a question and that'll be our last one. Okay. Hi there, Ellie. Hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. It, it really has been inspiring in the ways that you wanted it to be. I, I truly believe that. Thank I'll you. try to make my question kind of quick and it's more so kind of trying to feel out what I want to do um, for the pop culture class midway through the semester students in small groups give a big presentation the industry pitch assignment and so in class that's face to face with you know powerpoint slides and then you know these groups of four or five students and i'm hoping fingers crossed that we can do those presentations in class with the hybrid course um, okay and i'm also teaching sp100 online with this assignment for the first time i mm -hmm. i haven't taught 100 online for years. And so this is my first time doing that. And I know some of the other instructors have required like a PowerPoint presentation with embedded narration for that. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Um, although I think Kurt now is maybe requiring videos. So mm -hmm. each student does like a video of their portion of the presentation. And I think they then individually maybe upload like the five videos and then also the PowerPoint. It's not, it wouldn't be very slick you know, but it yeah. gets the job done. Sure. Um, for the hybrid class, once again, hoping they're presenting face to face, yeah. but if we have to switch to online due to a COVID surge, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, do I, do I have them do videos individually and then the PowerPoint, or do I just do PowerPoint with narration? Maybe it'll be due to time constraints. I'll choose one over the other, you know, whatever yeah. easiest for students, but what do you think? Yeah. So, um, one of the things that students did in my capstone class, which was really something I hadn't thought of, um, but that really solved this issue is they just recorded a Zoom meeting. So, they can share their screen just like how we're doing, um, and then they, they'll have the PowerPoint associated with it. 
um, as long as they're, um, I think you have to be a admin, or I, you have to have a certain role in order to share your screen. But as long as you work that out, um, you can record, you can record the meeting. And um, that's a really great way of, of doing, doing that. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, for, for the students, I try to her, um, provide a variety of options for them to complete assignment because I don't want the technology to get in the way of them doing yeah. the assignment too. And I don't want it to be this big stressor, sure. but that's a great option that hadn't crossed my mind. And then they, if they record the zoom meeting, then they add me to it later on. No, so they, so they can actually, the, the zoom meeting will download and then you can upload that um, that video to Canvas. Okay. Um, we're having some issues with storage capabilities yeah. with Canvas, and so that's something that I would be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. um, they may have to upload it to like OneDrive or something. You might have to find a creative solution for you sure. to be able to access it. But I think as long as you don't have too many videos mm -hmm. um, and they're not too long, I think you'll yeah. be fine. That's awesome. I love this idea. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ellie. I just, I need to leave, but it was really awesome and inspi inspiring. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Indeed it was. I, I feel very privileged to have listened in on not only this fantastic presentation, but an equally robust, informative, and really inspiring discussion. So on behalf of the Reinvention Collaborative, I'd like to, again, Thank Dr. Eleanor Light uh, of the Department of Communication Studies at Colorado State University and her esteemed colleagues who have joined her today for this discussion. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.